Uh, yeah, so uh, it sounds uh, better than it is. The uh, Leeds-based software and data consultancy is me and Dan. Um, so there you go. Uh, and well, what else do I do? There's going to be that. Um, there's going to be four things. Introduction to me. That's answering the what else do you do question. Uh, the past of open data, because I think we're too focused on what open data means now and in the future. And in fact, we've got, we've got a really proud history, a great history in this country of open data going back centuries. Uh, actually, Tom showed you know, the biggest open data discovery in the world was discovering cholera and curing it in London. So we've started from great places. We can go great places. I'm going to do a little bit different from Alex, which is give you loads and loads of examples that are really quick. And then my hope is that afterwards, you'll come and find the one that you thought was interesting and talk to me about it. So there's going to be a lot of stuff very quickly, rather than a lot of detail on one thing. So introduction-wise, uh, this is me. I've put software engineer in Activate. We write uh, and sell code that recognizes images. So if you've ever scanned a QR code, but it wasn't a QR code, it was maybe a Coke bottle or something, then we probably helped write some of that stuff. What's quite nice about that business model is uh, we put it all open. So if someone wanted to copy us, they could easily copy us. But we're better than the other people, so we are able to make a business out of it. Uh, we also do this nice software that puts all of the photos you've ever taken on a map, which you should definitely download on Windows 10. And we also do these children's books where you use this image recognition software, you scan the page on the children's book, and it reads out the, the content of the page in English or French or Chinese or Japanese, so on. So it's actually putting this image recognition to work. But I am also an associate at ODI Leads. Paul didn't Paul put a lot of pictures of ODI leads from the inside. This is a picture that I took from the outside. It's on the top floor there. And what that lets us do is sell the work that we do on data and software together to a much bigger audience. So if you say, we're two blokes in Leeds, would you like to give us a contract? Most people will start laughing and say, no, thanks. Now, if you're Alex at Bloom, you can say, well, we're a big company with huge clients. We've done this all before. And they'll say, yes. But what's great is through ODI Leads, I can work with people like Alex, people like Paul, and say, yes, we can deliver this project. It's guaranteed by ODI Leads. We can deliver that to a bigger audience. So I said I'd talk about the past. My favorite thing about the past is this book. This is the Public Transport for West Yorkshire Joint Statement by the West Yorkshire Metropolitan County Council. And it is from 1975. And it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's a lot of this stuff we see about open data is in here. I've put up one map there. I mean, this is like infographics from 1975. And in many ways, we've actually gone backwards on open data. And I think part of it is trying to recover what we've lost. This is a table from that book of every train service, every train line in West Yorkshire, how much, it, how much it cost to run, how much money it bought in, and what the deficit was. And I think this is the, no, no, yeah, I'm lying. York, Leeds, Bradford, Manchester, Micklefield, and Todmorden. So that's the one through Hebden Bridge, right down there. I've put in some locally relevant stuff today, so <laughs> keep your eyes peeled. One of the reasons that I uh, really like this is this, this showed us a picture of how people moved around West Yorkshire 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Now we don't have this picture. This is not open data now. We would like it to be open data, but it is not. And part of the thing that I think has gone badly in the north of England is that we've not understood where we failed. And I'd like us to understand better what opportunities we have to succeed in the future. This is a bus route, bus use in London. It's the blue line. And this is from 1970, so about the time of that report. And in the orange line is in every other English city put together. And that is a failure. That is a failure of public transport. That's a failure of moving people around, connecting communities, whatever you want to do. So the first thing that I am going to talk about, it's on my list, is buses. At the top left, is uh, Leeds City Council's current bus map. That is the bus map that they provide. Um, it's no better if it's in higher quality or zoomed in. 
However, we heard about Open Transport API earlier. You can just ask them where all the bus routes are. And you can draw all the bus routes. So you can say that for any given position, wherever you are, where are all the bus routes? Where can they take me? So what we started to do was ask the question, can we say, where does everybody work? That's every orange dot on that map is a job in West Yorkshire. And every green dot on that map is a person in West Yorkshire. And if you click on any green dot or any orange dot, it will tell you how buses connect every person with every job in West Yorkshire. So I clicked on Hebden Bridge here. Those are apparently all the buses. There's a 901 bus that goes to somewhere near Huddersfield. Is that right? Oh. Yes. He took the bus to get here. This is locally relevant presentations. So the idea with this is, though, that, that we've obviously failed with buses. We've not used data for 40 years, because that was the last open data report we had on it. Now we have open data again. Let's start being great at it again. Uh, these are some examples. This is the number one bus route in Leeds. Uh, it's a nice example because it stops here when it could carry on to a train station and it could carry on to the White Rose Shopping Centre, and it doesn't. And until you draw that on a map, you're not going to see that. You're not going to see that possibility. And instead, we spend a lot of time having consultations which are uninformed. We consult with the public, and the public are expected to understand an extremely complex situation and give their opinion. But there's no way that even the specialists can understand the complex situations. There's no chance of doing it. So this is about saying, when you run a consultation about bus route number one in Leeds or bus route 901 in Hebden Bridge, what information are people bringing to that question? Here's an example of four bus routes around Leeds and Bradford and Wakefield. And for each of them, we can use open data to say exactly how many people and how many jobs do those bus routes connect. So if you're having a discussion about which to subsidize, you can now have that discussion with a little bit of data behind it. So another thing that we have worked with a little bit, don't tweet too much about this one because it's not finished yet. But in Calderdale, hopefully soon, there will be a way to be reminded when your bins are ready to be collected the night before. The key here, though, is not this shiny app, actually. That's not the important part here. The difficult part and the hard part and the bit that we need to get right is that bit at the top, that is the entry from Leeds Data Mill. There will, I am sure, very soon, if not already, be a similar entry on the uh, Calderdale uh, data portal. And that is telling you for every property when the bins are collected. Now, that's not open data always currently. If it is, probably it should be. I mean, it's, it seems like something that together we own we should get to know when bins are collected. I'm going to go to another example. I said there'd be loads of examples. We're just going to go for loads of examples. At the moment, you will probably have seen hundreds and hundreds of adverts to expand Heathrow Airport, which probably annoy you because none of you have ever flown from Heathrow Airport. Because if you want to fly somewhere, you probably get the train or drive to Manchester. If you want to go on your holidays, you might fly from Leeds Bradford Airport. So we did a little bit of work, which was we, we used, you could call it big data. It's not a huge amount of data. We looked at 17 airports in the UK. We looked at 17 airports around the world. And we asked, what's the best way to fly between them? The answer came back that the always the best way was to fly via Amsterdam. <laughs> so go to Manchester, fly via Amsterdam. And, and what was nice about this is this wouldn't have happened without open data. So previously, you'd have required academics to do this study or consultancy for hundreds of thousands of pounds. I did this for 20 quid using Google's API. Uh, well, this is the debate that we had on Radio 4 and BBC Radio Scotland and City Metric and the New Statesman. So you can start to have now an informed and intelligent debate like me and Alex are having. <laughs> rather than one that's just based on who had the most money to commission the best report. Uh, this is just an absolute mess. But it's very relevant, especially yesterday. Uh, some very bad news. My dad used to work in Middlesbrough. Uh, some awful news about steel making in Middlesbrough. One of the problems that Teesside especially has, 
And we're talking about Yorkshire and Middlesbrough in Yorkshire, for those of you who are part of the Yorkshire Riding Society. Um, I know they're in the northeast now, but historically. One of the things there is that, that I don't think that parts of the UK develop new industries to replace the ones that were leaving. And part of the failure there was not to invest in government research and development. And, and we can have this chat a lot about it. And, and what we do in, in this map, and I did this again myself, didn't cost any money because it's open data. And you look at Germany at the top right and France and the UK, and you immediately see that Germany and France have invested more in research and development to have industries like that in places like Teesside that are relevant, and we haven't. And one of my particular passions is uh, to uh, split up England. If you look at UK official data, you will always see England. And I'm not really sure how relevant that is to people in Hebden Bridge. So one of the things that we did was we looked here. It turns out that private sector, that's business investment in R&D, is about the same in Yorkshire and Humber as Scotland and London. So it's not that business is spending more or less. All of the difference is in government spending. And I think if you are part of a Northern Council trying to argue for more investment, more innovation, this kind of thing helps you. And it's only possible because of open data. The people who would normally investigate this are at the London School of Economics somewhere publishing a report. Now we can make that case much more cheaply than we used to. Here's another one. It's really, this is, well, it's not a happy graph. It's a sad graph, but it's a nice graph. On here is how many kids in each parliamentary constituency go to university. And across here is how many kids live in poverty. And this is for Yorkshire and, and Humber region. So Sheffield Hallam is absolutely gorgeous if you've ever been there. It's, according to official statistics, no children live in poverty there. And it has a huge number of them go to university. Down in bottom place, Leeds Central, uh, very high poverty, very uh, low rate of people going to university. And right in the middle is Calder Valley. I put that up just now. Again, another locally relevant addition to the chart. But you could be asking this within the sense of how do we innovate? How do we get great people into great businesses where we live? This is part of the answer. It's about looking at these places and saying, how can we make Leeds Central more like somewhere that's in the middle here? How can we make Calder Valley more like Sheffield Hallam? Uh, we did all this for every part of the UK. So uh, London's really, really good. If you are a poor kid in London, you are quite likely to go to university. If you are a poor kid in Glasgow, you are less likely to go to university. And this let us do a ranking. This has already been very influential in saying to people that England is doing very well at improving its education system. Yorkshire is not. And we now know where we can answer that. We know where the problems are. We can look at solving them. And again, this is all possible because of open data. Five years ago, I would have had to go into a closed room and ask for education statistics, and they would have been under embargo. And I would have been told at the end of it that because I'm not a professional in education statistics, statistics, I wasn't allowed to say anything at the end of it. Well, now I can just do it. So we've, op we've, we've entered a new way of innovating. Here's another nice story. Uh, I recently moved to Birmingham. This is like a massive issue in Birmingham, which is that the BBC don't exist there. They do the archers in Birmingham. That's it. Nothing else is, is done there. And this was about saying, where does the BBC raise money? Where does it spend money? Uh, I, we can all predict where that happens. But if you take the train 30 minutes to Manchester and go and have a look around Media City in Salford, you will see the amazing development. You'll see it in your graphs. Creative sector is booming. I'm sure there are people in Hebden who are working in those industries, getting more and better jobs. And part of that is about making this argument, redistributing, and making intelligent suggestions for the future. Again, this is not open data. Ah, caught you. This should be open data. The BBC should make it open data. They don't make it open data yet. So this took years of work by the Birmingham Post to uncover this data. 
is very hard. This is why this is not a big issue, because there's no way that most people can know about this to make the case. Uh, I wanted to give a big props to a Yorkshire, I was talking about Yorkshire open data. One of the best organizations in Yorkshire for open data is the Joseph Rowntree Foundation in York, who provide probably the best analysis uh, in the UK about poverty data. Their uh, uh, advocacy think tank, they're probably called. Uh, they do a huge amount of work on data to do with poverty, alleviating poverty in the UK, and they have an absolutely brilliant data portal at jrf.org.uk forward slash data. So have a look there. It's, it's very interesting. And uh, they have good people who you can chat to, and they will generally be pretty happy to help you out on anything to do with poverty. They only do poverty, nothing else. If it's you know, anything else, they're not interested. Here's another example. And this isn't one that I've done, actually. This is a, a different example. It's not from Yorkshire, unless we invade Sunderland. But Sunderland isn't too far from Middlesbrough, which is in Yorkshire, as I've previously said. So, oh no, I've lied. I've lied. Sunderland's later. This is Huddersfield, which definitely is in Yorkshire. So this is uh, from the Examiner, which is Huddersfield's uh, paper. Town centre crisis business leaders call for drastic action to fill more than 30 vacant units in Huddersfield. I think this is a big problem in a lot of places where high streets aren't as frequently used as before. What shops do we use to fill them up? I, I had this quote. It's a great quote of what I think is the old way of doing things and the way that we need to move towards a new way of doing things. This is the local... Labour MP saying that he's had great meetings with the council and he's got a team at the LSE undertaking some research into the situation. Well, I think that we don't need a team at the LSE to undertake research into the situation of empty shops in Huddersfield. I suspect that the people of Huddersfield, and they've got a great university there, would be better at answering those questions. So, this is the answer to that question. We heard from Tom a, another example, which is nice. It's the answer to the question of, I want to open a cafe, where should I open it? That question, if you want to ask it, is a 20 to 50,000 pound question. Sainsbury's will ask that question every time they open a new little shop. They will be asking that question. What if you could ask that question as a small business person for free? And this is uh, a company in Oxford called Pikaya. They've made this product, which they are trialing in Sunderland and Leeds. It looks at every empty property in the city. It looks at data like footfall, which you no longer need to pay for. It looks at data like business rates. It looks at data such as similar shops nearby, because you don't want to open three chip shops in a row. And it suggests to you, for free, as a small business, someone's thinking of starting a small business, where you should put your shop. And it says, no, don't put it here. That's a poor place to put your butcher shop, whatever. What about here? That's a better place to do it. You're getting real value for society from open data that used to cost a huge amount of data. And I kind of see that as an unapologetic capitalist. I see that as a massive victory. This is about saying people want to run businesses, and currently, these huge businesses have a massive advantage, which stops people running small businesses that all of us probably want to shop at. This takes that advantage away. That makes the playing field level for everyone. I think this is a brilliant uh, product. Check it out there. Um, and if anyone in Collardale wants them to do something in Halifax, then they would love to hear from you. Now. The last thing, more or less, is housing. So we talked about housing a little bit earlier. I did this uh, nightmare map, a spaghetti graph, is uh, what I think scientists call them, for a friend of mine, Joe, who works uh, in housing. He used to be at the National Housing Federation, but he's moved jobs recently. He drew it on the back of a fag packet. I did it in Illustrator, because I can. This is the housing crisis in one chart. Uh, there's ver versions online. 
And this is what, when we talk to people about consulting on neighborhood plans and local planning site allocations and uh, the next door neighbor extending their garage, this is what we're looking at. And yet we expect a coherent and sensible policy that solves the problem by asking people, even though the, co the problem is this complex. So we've been taking quite a few steps uh, over time to try and solve different parts of this problem. I'm going to show you them, and then it's the end. So the reason why this is important is that in different cities, you can earn more money. It makes sense. If you uh, live in London, you can earn more money. If you live in Leeds, you can earn more money. If you live in Manchester, you can't earn more money. Got him. Um, but all of these advantages kind of float away when you pay rent. So on the right hand side here is how much extra money you're earning after you've paid rent. So all of your advantages of being super productive and uh, a tech guru and whatever living in London are gone by the time you pay your rent. Whereas Leeds <laughs> and Manchester and Bristol actually, which surprised me, but there you go, um, you still have money left over. We, I think, should all want to keep this situation so that Leeds, Manchester, and Bristol, but mostly Leeds and Manchester, keep that advantage because we want great new businesses in Leeds and Manchester. We want people to not have all their money spent on rent so they can spend it going to Leeds United and then they can afford to buy better players and win the Champions League. <laughs> right? Huddersfield Town are also available. Uh, right. I would hope to see this will all happen in Calderdale's wonderful data portal soon. Some of it will already probably be there. On Leeds Data Mill, there are 28 data sets to do with housing, and it's everything. It's like, uh, what date was every council house ever built in, in the city? When was it sold? Who was it sold to on right to buy? How much is it worth now? Who made the money from it? It's every single empty property by ward, and how, many, how much that's been evolving over 10 years. It's every single existing planning permission that's available on every plot in the city. So it's all the places where houses could be built in the future where they've already been given permission. So here's an, an example of something we built. Um, it's just loads of graphs. But the main thing to look at is that they all go down. And that is because Leeds used to have about 12,000 empty homes. It used, now has about 6,000 empty homes. The number has since gone down even further. And if you ever want to try and build any homes or build a new factory or build a new business in Leeds and you put in a planning permission, the first thing that comes back is someone saying, yeah, but there are loads of empty flats just around the corner from there. Well, actually, no, there aren't. So you see, this is a city, it's just down. I mean, there's, there's not much empty flats. This tells a story to decision makers. It tells a story to citizens about what the needs are, where the needs might be, and what we need to do. So that when we're having these consultations about what type of society we want to build in the next 10, 20 years, we're basing it on some facts and some data rather than how we feel very locally. And hopefully, we make better decisions based on that. This is an example of something that we produced from all of that data and eight other pieces of data. There might even be more than eight other pieces of data. It might be like 10 or 12. Dan just finished this like two days ago, the new version. It's very nice. This is working with a charity in Leeds called Leeds Empties. They might, uh, a non-profit anyway in Leeds called Leeds Empties. We got some money from Innovate UK. We work with Leeds Data Mill. And what we do is for any property that's empty in the city, they can type in the address of the property. We never get to know the address of the property. This is part of the privacy uh, and public problem. So we shouldn't get to know which properties are empty because we could go and rob them. Right? So we don't get to know that. It doesn't matter. We use open data for the bits that are safe, and we provide them a report and a customized letter for that property, detailing exactly why that owner should bring that property back into use. And the hope is that if instead of saying, your property is empty, we're about to fine you, if the council can say, your property is empty, 
and 204 families in your area are looking for a home, and last time they bid for council flats, they were oversubscribed by a factor of 10, that that is a more effective push to action than it would otherwise be. Well, you can't do that for 6,000 properties, but it doesn't matter because we write the letter for you. So no one has to physically write the letter, we write the letter for you. And then at the end, you copy the letter to Word and fix up the bits that don't quite work or remove the bits that you didn't think were compelling. Uh, another part of a nice property, this is from Private Eye did this, this was great. Uh, they looked at all the overseas owned property. There's only two in Hebden Bridge. So uh, there's some property owned in Belize, just over there, and there's some property owned in Gibraltar by Leveno Limited, uh, also just near the train station. I've no idea, because you'll have to look it up yourselves. But this type of open data is a good way of saying when you, when you want to build something and people say, well, it'll just go to overseas investors and we'll never see any benefit of it. Well, we have the data now. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but at least we know now. And this is a very early version of stuff that we've been doing with Paul and Alex to do with Data City but from a different angle. So Alex is really looking at people interacting with businesses in the digital sector. We're really looking at housing, green space, and parking. Parking is great. In, in the center of Leeds, about half the space is parking. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. So you've got everyone saying, oh, there's no space to build anything, and then there's a huge car park. Well, we can map all those, all the gray, Polygons are where the parking is. Everyone's saying, well, we need more green space near where we live, so we don't want to build any homes. Great, there's all the green space. Let's see where there is green space already, and let's think about what we can do in that sense. And everyone's also always saying, well, all these homes will just have students in, so all the red dots are places where students live in Leeds, which, if you know Leeds, the university is there. So the red dots are around it. Uh, and we've also got on here planning applications, council houses, council tax bans, lots more stuff coming. So as the data is made open, we will provide an explorer so that people can look at it. And this is the last slide, I think. This is kind of, for me, I saw this the other day, and I was really, really happy. I was so happy I put a smiley face on my tweet about it. So we've been kind of working with the council in Leeds for a year and a half to say, could you tell us where the planning permissions are? Could you tell us where you're planning to build new homes? And then the other day, they just went, yes, we can. So now, instead of just having a paper form to fill in with no background of what it is you're discussing, now if you want to comment on where Leeds will or will not build homes, you look at the map, you click on a pink bit, one that's probably near your house, it will show you what's being planned for it, it will show you what the pros and cons are, what the transport assessment is, and so on. And then at that point, you can comment on the site. And I think that this is part of making places work better with citizens by getting not necessarily more consultation, but getting more informed consultation that instead of fighting with a council or local government or developers, works with them to deliver something better. So in this case, I have a, uh, Austin's not here, uh, Russell, Russell's not here. I have a good friend, Russell, who lives just there. And pink means we're gonna build loads of houses. <laughs> Yeah, he's not very happy. But these kind of things let you make that case, don't they? They let you say, well, I'm, I'm right here. You, you are getting rid of the only playing fields near me. Before, you're just looking at little individual maps. This shows you it in the context of the whole thing. So, in summary, open data isn't new. Quickly building products with it is. So that first map that I showed you from this book Probably there was a, a full drawing team within the council who used sticky bits of paper and made reliefs and wax and 
all that kind of stuff. Well, now it's pretty quick to do. The UK's biggest challenges are where open data is poor. That's what I believe anyway, that homes, empty shops, poverty, health, transport, where the data is poor is also where we're facing big challenges. Open data lets us argue our case and challenge our own assumptions. The second one is important for me. I'm an extremely stubborn person, but I have also been uh, trained almost to death as a scientist. And so I am able on very rare occasions to change my mind, but it's always when there's a compelling case that someone can show me on a map, go, no, you're wrong, Tom. And I go, ah, ah. And then I pretend I was right all along a few weeks later. That's how I work. Uh, open data informs consultations. It will let us build better things together. That's my hope for it all. That's, that's the, the end game of it. Uh, that's me. That's ODI Leeds. That's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, any questions for Tom? Any questions at all? You must have covered it all, Tom. Thanks uh -huh. very much indeed. But do talk to me. I've got uh, examples of all this stuff later, so we can play around with it. Thank you very much, Tom. The what? Oh yeah, there's an open there at ODI Leeds on the 21st of October and people from all over the country are going to be there and they will be listening to this same talk. So if you want to arrive after that, uh, then you're, you're very welcome. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Superb. Thank you. A big round of applause for Tom. Thanks.